Hello, um, thank you so much for joining um, this digital lecture series, which is generally held on Mondays, although last week we decided to go wild and have it every night of the week or night here, afternoon elsewhere, morning in some places. So thanks a lot for joining today. Um, the series is organized by The Philosopher. Um, the new issue has just come out. It's a public philosophy journal based in the UK. It's been running for almost 100 years. And normally we run events around the UK um, to which Tom Stern, one of our speakers, was going to be speaking on exactly this day. But obviously um, COVID intervened and now it is a digital event. And obviously that has certain advantages. For example, he's able to be in conversation today with Paul Katsafanas, which would have been logistically very difficult if it had been in person. So um, I'm really excited to have this conversation between Tom and Paul. Just, um, just to introduce them both, Tom is based at UCL. He's a um, assistant professor of philosophy, specializing in 19th century German philosophy, especially Schopenhauer and Nietzsche. His book, Nietzsche's Ethics, after which the um, topic for well, the title for tonight came, was published last year by Cambridge University Press. Um, Paul Katsafanas is an associate professor of philosophy at Boston University. His, his research focuses at the intersection of ethics and philosophy of mind. He all, he's also written about Nietzsche. He wrote a book called The Nietzschean Self and edited a collection called The Nietzschean Mind. So his research looks at the nature of agency, the notion of drive and the concept of free will and unified agency. So for this event, Tom and Paul will be looking at Nietzsche who obviously we know did certain blistering critiques of morality, but can we say that there is in fact something like an ethic that Nietzsche presents in his work? And if so, what kind of relevance does it have today? So um, in terms of just a few basic things, Tom and Paul will start their discussions shortly. It'll probably last till about 35 minutes past the hour. Um, if you have any questions for either of them, please send them through at any time using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. I'll be posting some things into the chat function, um, <clears throat> linked to Tom's website, to Paul's faculty homepage. It would be lovely to hear from any of you where you are um, in the world right now, how things are, um, what you think of Nietzsche, whatever it may be. So I'll stop nattering and um, hopefully Paul and Tom will uh, magically appear on the screens in the next second or two and then I'll hand it over to them for the main bit of the event. So I hope you'll really enjoy it and thanks very much to Tom and Paul for agreeing to take part in this. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to this event. So I'm going to start off and I'll just say a few words about Nietzsche's ethics. So I think Tom and I discussed what a good format would be and we thought that if we spent a couple of minutes saying how we would present Nietzsche's ethics to a general audience, um, that might be a good way of getting the initial conversation going. So what I would say is that um, when you look at Nietzsche's texts, I think one thing sort of leaps out at you. He criticizes values, cultures, individuals, moralities in terms of life, health, power, flourishing, and a number of related notions, right? But that's the most common thing that we find in Nietzsche's text. So he'll tell us that Christianity impedes life or that Wagner is decadent or that Socrates rejected life or that modern morality undermines flourishing and so forth. Um, and then if we look at some of his later texts, uh, like in the Antichrist, he'll just flatly assert and I'll, I'll read a quotation from him. He says, what's good? Everything that heightens the feeling of power in man, the will to power, power itself. What's bad? Everything born of weakness. So, I mean, in light of passages like that, I think it's pretty clear that Nietzsche is recommending that we assess individuals, cultures, values, and so forth in terms of life or health or power. Right? And he thinks that certain values, the ones that have been dominant for the past 2,000 years or so, undermine life, health, and power. 
um, and that others might promote it, or at least inhibit it to a lesser extent. Okay, so I, I take it that's the basic, that's the gist of his ethical theory, right? Um, the stuff that we've been doing so far has undermined life, health, or power. We need new sort of values, new cultural institutions, new ways of relating to ourselves in the world that would promote life, health, and power. But I mean, just to say a few more things about that, I guess the, the most obvious question that that raises is, well, I guess there are a couple actually. So there's the question of how life and health and power relate to one another, right? So Nietzsche will often mention those notions in the same paragraph or even in the same sentence. So it's clear that they're supposed to be related in some way, um, but how exactly? So my own view, which I defend um, in some of my uh, papers and in my book, uh, Agency and the Foundation of Ethics and so forth, is that power is the, the fundamental notion. So I think that Nietzsche defines life and health in terms of this notion he calls will to power. Um, so that what promotes life or health for Nietzsche is basically what maximizes the potential expression of will to power. That's, that's simplified a bit. There's actually life and health, I think, pick out slightly different ways of relating to will to power, but will to power is the fundamental notion. And I think that explains um, why Nietzsche talks so much about will to power. I mean, so will to power for him is, uh, to put it very simply, you exhibit will to power when you engage in challenge seeking behavior. So I interpret his claims about power as follows, that I, I will power when I not only aim to accomplish some end or to realize some goal, but also aim to do so in a way that introduces challenges or obstacles that I would overcome in the course of achieving that end. So trying to write a difficult philosophy paper, trying to produce a, a, a challenging novel, trying to go on a challenging hike, those are the sorts of things that would manifest will to power for Nietzsche. Um, so we can talk more about that. I mean, I guess another question is, why we should care about life or health or power. So, you know, if Nietzsche is repeatedly telling us that these central cultural institutions and values and so forth undermine life or health or power, um, lots of things do that in the ordinary sense, right? Like alcohol undermines an ordinary notion of health, but I still, you know, pop into the pub for a drink and, you know, I, I balance my health against other goods. So you can imagine someone objecting to Nietzsche, you know, if Christianity or if modern morality or egalitarian values or one of the other things that Nietzsche criticizes, let's grant that that undermines health in some sense, but maybe we just need to balance that against the costs of abandoning that institution. I mean, maybe like alcohol, those things undermine health, but add a bit of zest to life or have some other benefit, right? So that sort of question I think is especially pressing for Nietzsche because he likes to emphasize that the bad can be intertwined with the good. And in fact, that the bad can be a, an essential constituent of the good. So we need to think about why Nietzsche thinks we should care about life, health, or power. Um, I think this is actually one part, what, one area in which Tom and I part ways. So I'm sure Tom will have some stuff to say about this, but I think Nietzsche has an argument um, that's grounded in his philosophical psychology that establishes that power, this notion of will to power that Nietzsche is operating with, is um, it has a special status in the sense that it arises from an aim power that Nietzsche takes to be omnipresent and ineradicable. So I think that Nietzsche is pointing to a necessary feature of our psychologies manifest in all of our actions and arguing that because that feature is ineradicable, but can be expressed in a conflicted or bungled form that we have reason to care about things that generate those conflicts. I think Tom has a different story about this, but in my book, Agency and the Foundations of Ethics, I talk about how I think the, the will to power thesis is this argument that starts from facts about human agency and Nietzsche thinks ends up with this conclusion about what we have reason to value. So that's what we ground that critique. And, um, you know, this is very schematic. So there are lots of other things to talk about. So we could wonder about how exactly things like Christianity or modern morality are supposed to undermine life or health or power. So how's that supposed to work? Um, there's also complications. So for example, Nietzsche embraces a form of anti-universalism. So he thinks that different values are appropriate 
for different sorts of people, right? So he wants to reject universalized claims of what's good and bad for all, and instead embrace more particularized claim about what's good or bad for certain types of people um, or certain cultures and so forth. So there are complications um, that arise there too that we can talk about. But I guess um, I'll finish up now. I'll just say that I think the core idea in Nietzsche is just that we critique various dominant cultural tendencies, values, and so forth in terms of their effects on life or health, which are then defined in terms of power. And that Nietzsche has an argument based in his philosophical psychology, which he thinks establishes um, a kind of priority for power. In other words, it establishes a reason that not just some people, but all people should care about power. Um, but I, I think that's enough for now. I'll, I'll stop and um, give Tom some time. Great, thank you. So first of all, to state the obvious, I'm sorry about the flickering screen. Um, if it gets infuriating, I'm trying to learn to like it. It's new. I'm trying to hope that it becomes modernist and kind of edgy, but it's actually perhaps a little irritating. The only alternative is to turn off the, um, the video. I'm going to just run with it now and you can tell me if that's a problem. Um, I'm going to basically summarize my understanding of Nietzsche's ethics in three claims. Um, and then I'm going to say something at the end about perhaps some of the ways in which uh, it differs from Paul's view. But I should say from the start that I kind of think, you know, from the outside perspective, probably Paul and I are going to sound like we're saying very, very similar things. And probably that's good because probably it means we're kind of hovering around the same kind of position. And, you know, um, uh, maybe we're both just kind of in the right sort of place. And from the point of view of someone watching this, it doesn't matter too much what the differences are. But, you know, I will say something about at the end about what I think that might be. Um, OK, so what are the three claims? So the first claim, I think, is uh, a claim about biology. It's about what it is to be a living thing. And uh, now if you imagine uh, a kind of um, horror show version of a nature documentary where the animals are not trying to uh, survive and reproduce, or rather they are trying to survive and reproduce, but they are uh, fundamentally or most deeply uh, aiming at increasing power. Um, and moreover, it's not just that the animals are most fundamentally or most deeply aiming at increasing power. It's also perhaps that were you to kind of um, lift up the cover and look at what's going on beneath or within these animals, that the only way that they survive is by internally competing for power within themselves. So it's not just that you and I are engaged in some kind of protracted power struggle and so are all plants and all animals, but even my organs are perhaps fighting each other and my cells are fighting each other. And it's somehow in the conflict between all the um, living things that there are that you get this seemingly stable, sometimes even seemingly orderly, peaceful kind of natural environment. But really, when it comes down to it, underneath it all, there is power and power seeking and conflict and appropriation and, you know, attempts at taking control. Okay, so that, um, uh, that view is the biological claim about the world that I think Nietzsche makes. And, uh, you know, he's, he's making that or he's taking that on based on things that we know he read, and it's not as far fetched um, as perhaps it might seem now. Um, I'm not saying that that was the only view available, but it's one of the views that might have been available to him at the time. Okay, so that's the biological view. Uh, now I want you to imagine that, or add to that a second claim, which is a claim about our cultural and moral institutions. So uh, now I want you to imagine that you've got the biological story, which is that everything's constantly seeking power, uh, violently appropriating everything else and so on. Um, but when you ask your priest or you ask your moral philosopher, uh, 
where you ask your parent, your conventional parent figure, or in fact, Nietzsche would say many of your artistic heroes, or perhaps even um, your, your scientists and scholars, if you were to sum up what they thought you ought to do, they would say a series of things which just flatly contradict the picture that I've just painted. So they would say you ought to not seek power. You ought to be um, selfless. You ought to put yourself last. You ought to um, think about what your own needs are in relation to the needs of others and suppress them and so on and so forth. And when you put those two claims together, you begin to see the way that Nietzsche uh, sees the world. I'm talking about towards his later writings. And the best way I can think about by way of analogy for that is that um, it's almost as though when Nietzsche sees those cultural institutions or moral um, teachers or whatever, it's a little bit like seeing an advertisement for a product, um, you know, let's say for Coca-Cola or Pepsi. Um, I'll say both so you don't think I'm, you know, um, uh, uh, insulting or, or, or anything, one or the other. Uh, let's imagine that you saw a series of billboards and they were definitely by the Coca-Cola company and they definitely said, um, don't drink Coca-Cola, it's poisonous. Whatever you do, avoid Coca-Cola. Then it said, you know, this advert was sponsored by Coca-Cola or similarly with Pepsi. So I saw something which said, um, Pepsi is poisonous and will murder your children. I don't think it will, by the way, but anyway, that's what the sign says, you know, and this was definitely by the Pepsi company. Now, whatever it is that you thought was going on in such a situation, um, it's something weird, okay? That's the point. And the analogy I'm trying to draw is the way that Nietzsche thinks that's, the, the way that Nietzsche looks at our moral and cultural institutions, which are after all, the product of living beings, we know that life only operates, he thinks, by power seeking, um, violence, appropriation, selfishness, all of that. That's taken to be a natural fact. And yet, for some reason, we as creatures have developed religious codes, moral codes, scholarly codes, which tell us not to do the very thing that we know that you have to do to stay alive. And there are a lot of different ways that one could go with that. Um, and I think Paul said a similar thing. You could say, well, that's great. We've overcome what nature looks like. You know, nature's nasty and brutish and horrible. And we've got moral institutions which combat that nastiness. But that's absolutely not the view that Nietzsche takes. And this is the third claim. So the first one was that the biology looks like this. It's power seeking, it's struggle, it's violence, it's appropriation. The second one is that the cultural institutions seem to transmit a message which is counter to how we know that life fundamentally works. The third thing is that what we ought to do is reinvigorate the story that's on the side of life, biology, biology and be more power seeking and be more brutal and be more violent and be more oppressive and be more and so on and so on and so on. And, uh, you know, there are, so philosophically we might object at any point in this, we might think that that's not how the biology works. We might think that that's not actually what the church tells us or what the scholars tell us. We certainly might say that whatever else is going on, he hasn't provided us with a good reason to be more like how life already sort of is. But I think it's true that probably Nietzsche thinks that we should be more like how he thinks life is. And uh, th that's the ethical force of his argument. Now, uh, I think probably what I've just said, largely speaking with the possible exception of the first thing, which was about biology, pretty much, you know, I, you know, um, I wouldn't expect anyone to find much difference with what Paul just said. So he can, he can correct me, someone else can correct me, but that seems like plausibly like we're on the same side here. Maybe the biological story is a little bit different. I don't know where he stands towards that. I'm less inclined to see it as a view about human psychology. I'm more inclined to see it as a view about what it is to be a living being. And I think what it is to be a living being and humans are just living beings is we are power seekers. But, you know, so are snails and so are plants. 
and you don't really need a complex story about human psychology to kind of get get the general picture of this and uh so you know that that's i mean i suppose that's that's why i haven't in my own work tended to focus so much on the psychology story when reconstructing Nietzsche's view I think all he really needs to say is you're a living being therefore you're a power seeker therefore it's weird that you have institutions which tell you not to be a power seeker and I Nietzsche am throwing my money in with the side that will reinvigorate and, and make life better and I basically think that that um that that you can have everything you need from understanding Nietzsche by that. And I think the philosophical problems that arise um, are genuine, but they are Nietzsche's problems, you know, not, 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 not problems with the interpretation as it were. So I think that's a good point for me to stop. And hopefully that gives us enough to, to talk about between us and also for you to, for, for you to ask questions about. And my apologies again about this flickering screen. I promise you I'm, 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 it's, it's the screen, not me. I'm stable. Um, yeah, so I, I agree, as Tom was saying, with a lot of um, these claims. Um, I guess where I would disagree, one point would be the biology story, about how central the biology is. So I guess I would say two things about that. Like, I, I agree that Nietzsche is very interested in establishing claims about how all biological organisms and perhaps even all physical things manifest this um, tendency toward power. So he sometimes even considers whether we could express claims about um, efficient cause in terms of power or whether things like gravity and so forth can be understood in, as in some way manifestations of power seeking. Um, I guess I rest less interpretive weight on those passages because I see them as underdeveloped in comparison to the psychology. Um, Nietzsche has lots of really fascinating and insightful things to say about human psychology, I think. Uh, he's an incredibly subtle thinker on that topic. I find his biological speculations less impressive um, and also less specific. So it, it's looking at these claims about how force can be understood as power or how trees in outgrowing one another can be understood as um, striving to dominate one another. Fine. Um, I see that we could talk that way. I see less that, that's gained in talking that way. And I see less reliance on those notions in Nietzsche's ethical arguments. Like I think the psychological arguments are sufficient to establish the ethical conclusions that Nietzsche is really interested in. So I guess that would be one thing. I just think the psychology is much more developed and interesting in Nietzsche than the biological speculations and that the psychology is sufficient for getting the ethical conclusions. I, I guess another thing though is I'm, I'm skeptical that we could sort of set the psychology aside in the same way that I'm suggesting we could set the biology aside. Um, because even if it were true in some sense that both human beings and trees and amoeba and you know cats and dogs all will power, presumably the particular ways that human beings will power are going to look very different than the way that simpler organisms will power. So there are going to be interactions with um, things like culture with norms, with explicitly held values, with conscious beliefs and things like that in the human case that wouldn't arise in the case of like trees or birds or amoeba and things like that. So I feel like the psychology is unavoidable um, in cashing out Nietzsche's ethical view. Um, and I feel like it's what he spends most of his time writing about. Whereas the biology, I, I don't want to deny that it's definitely there. And I think Tom's quite right to point to these other 19th century thinkers who Nietzsche is drawing from um, in, to my mind, a somewhat haphazard way, but is nonetheless drawing from. Um, I, I just, I'm skeptical that it bears um, too much weight in the, the ethical theorizing that Nietzsche does. Um, well, uh, so, a couple of things about that. So f first of all, um, uh, you know, I think part of this is, um, so part of this is to what extent can you get around the psychological story? Um, my feeling about that is kind of Nietzsche thinks you can. I mean, effectively that would be to disagree with the idea that he puts a lot of weight on the psychology in his accounts. It seems to me that the way that the life story works is 
a kind of fundamental evaluative criterion, which is another way of saying like, when Nietzsche looks at a person or an ethical institution, he's saying, how does this stand in relation to life? And we don't read people who write like that very much anymore, but he did. There's a long tradition of people who are either trying to set up, say, Christianity, um, uh, um, would so I see something in the chat about the flickering, and I can absolutely turn it off if somebody would like to, like me to do that. Um, but I'll take instruction from Anthony about that if perhaps that's easiest. Um, so uh, the the um, so the idea is you take something like Christianity, and you say, um, so what does it do? Does it help the underlying biological thing that's going on, or does it hinder it? Now, that seems like a weird question to me now as a you know citizen of 2020 western europe or whatever but it wasn't a weird question for nietzsche's local philosophical community and um and a common feature among these ways of thinking is that it wasn't very easy to integrate their views about psychology with their views about there being this underlying force that controlled all of biology and life i mean that is just hard you know and i think i think in a way it's still true for us you might think if you're a sort of crude evolutionary theorist that you're biologically set up to survive and reproduce. But as you know, lots of people behave in lots of ways which don't um, correlate to those things. And, you know, it's as hard for us as it was for them, probably harder for them to map those things together. So it's a difficult thing to do. Um, and maybe he tries to do it a little bit. I don't think, I don't personally think he does it particularly well on the psychology side. Um, but in a sense, what I'm saying is you can get your story about the ethics straight through running straight from the story about life to the story about the way that human beings kind of ought to behave in relation to that um, account of the biology. And the psychology account is a, it's almost like I can just say, well, whatever it is, it's a black box. We know what comes in and we know what goes out. And, you know, like we can talk about it in its own right if we want to, but we don't need to talk about it in relation to his ethics. I think that's that's the sort of, you know, that is that does seem to be where if there are differences of opinion here, they lie. But I also wanted to say something, um, uh, uh, sort of a second thing about that, which might also account for this difference, because, because, um, you know, there are there are there are very many different ways to read a figure in the history of philosophy. And uh, I think, again, from the outside, Paul and I are actually doing very similar things. So I don't want to make a sort of bigger thing than it, you know, people have read Nietzsche very, 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 very differently from both of us. You know, we're both trying to spell out the arguments and we're both trying to kind of comb through it and make sense of it and so on. Um, we're both writing in English, we're both writing in sort of, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but I'm very much thinking about what I'm doing is trying to present a historical account of a figure and I'm not presenting myself as giving you um, the best version. Um, so, you know, I'm not interested in developing a story where I get at the end of this talk, you've all thought to yourselves, and Nietzsche was right. You know, I kind of think Nietzsche was obviously wrong. I think he was historically interesting, and I think of myself as doing history in some sense. But I wonder whether what Paul is doing is slightly different, and that might account for some of the difference, which is that what he's doing, certainly in his book, as I understood it, was kind of saying, I think this is pretty much what Nietzsche thought, but more to the point, isn't this interesting? And it seems like it's perfectly well within my rights to say, yeah, it's really interesting. And in my opinion, it's not quite what Nietzsche was saying. And so we could sort of even be agreeing um much more so than disagreeing in that respect but that's my that's my sort of that's my thought and i'll stop there yeah i mean just to say briefly on that last point um i agree with a lot of that so like i think that the views i attribute to nietzsche are both true and nietzsche's um so i'm i, I guess i i don't want to say that um I, I don't have that same relation to every other philosopher though, right? Like I think a lot of philosophers are mistaken. So I think that um, Nietzsche has views that are both philosophically defensible and are actually his, his views. Um, but I, I, do, I do think it's valuable to acknowledge that Nietzsche can be wrong. And a lot of what he says might be underdeveloped or it might depend on discredited notions. I actually agree with Tom that some elements of Nietzsche's thought are like that. Um, so I think his 
political theorizing is rather underdeveloped. Um, yeah, I think his epistemology and metaphysics, I, I think there are stronger philosophers on those topics. Um, it's just that I actually think that on philosophical psychology and its relation to ethics, I, I guess I think that Nietzsche's arguments are both true and important. Um, but I realize, you know, we're all, we're all liable to be misled by our, uh, by our desires to show certain things. And it's, it's possible that I'm, uh, you know, I'm reading into Nietzsche some stuff that's not there. But I, I would say on the biology point, I'm, I'm skeptical that you could actually, so I, I see that at a very general level, you could try to leave out the psychology and just go from biology to, to ethical conclusion, essentially. But when we look at what Nietzsche is actually doing in the text, it's, I think, less clear how that could possibly work. So for example, his critiques of Christianity, it's going to depend, um, those critiques are going to depend on particular characterizations of how Christianity is operating in our psychologies, right? It's going to depend on what Christianity induces us to do, the values that it induces us to take up, the ways of relating to one another, uh, the ways of conceptualizing our own agency and so forth. So I think a lot of the most interesting work um, that Nietzsche's doing is on those sorts of topics, these topics that are squarely within philosophical psychology. So it's, it's just that, um, like, I, I agree that he's, I, I think Tom's right that there is this biological tendency in Nietzsche. Um, and I would not at all want to deny that Nietzsche himself probably wants to um, use those biological claims in an argument for this ethical theory. It's just that I think the, um, the philosophical psychology, whether Nietzsche recognized it or not, can be divorced from those sorts of biological claims. And then it's really the philosophical psychology, the claims about human motivations and how they operate and how they relate to values and to power and so forth. It's really that that I think is, is doing the work in his ethical critiques. Um, but of course, I, I guess establishing that would require looking very closely at text and so forth and arguments in a way that's inappropriate right now. Um, I, I do agree that Tom and I are, from an outside perspective, we're basically saying the same thing and disagreeing about some matters of emphasis. So I, I do think there's a lot of agreement amongst us and the, the real disagreement is just coming out of these uh, subtler interpretive issues. We, we, in our original time frame, we imagined, I think, that this was around about the time that we would start taking questions. Is that is that correct, Anthony? Would you like to come in at this point? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to, to come back in. And um, I mean, there've been quite a lot of questions coming in as is always the case. Um, so let me, th there was one, I, I suppose that there's a couple which I'd say are quite um, sort of foundational. So if, if you like comparing Nietzsche to other thinkers. So there's one from Jose Yakov, which asks about Nietzsche in relation to Aristotle. So I, I, I wonder if, um, although Jose doesn't specifically ask this, whether virtue is an important part of Nietzsche's ethical picture, and if so, how would that differ from traditional Aristotelian virtues? Um, I'll start with Paul arbitrarily, and then we'll go okay. with Tom for the next one. Sure. Um... I mean, so I actually think that the argument that Nietzsche gives that's supposed to establish the normative standing of power looks really similar to Aristotle's famous function argument from the Nicomachean Ethics. So, uh, I mean, I think there are subtle differences, but like, uh, I, I mean, one way of interpreting Aristotle is he's trying to ground facts about flourishing in facts about human nature, essentially. And at a, a high level of generality, I take Nietzsche to be doing the same thing. Um, specifically with regard to virtue though, um, if you want a, a, a really strong argument that Nietzsche is deeply concerned with virtue, you can take a look at Mark Alfano's book where he, Mark actually does some interesting textual analysis where he uses these, um, what are they called, semantic networks or something where basically he looks at the prevalence and interconnectedness of various terms in Nietzsche's writings and, and tries to show that virtue is actually like a really central concern for Nietzsche in a way that I find or found somewhat surprising. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there is, I haven't myself really worked on Nietzsche and virtue very much and I don't have any settled views on the topic, but I think that um, there is some powerful evidence that Nietzsche is interested in something like virtues, although obviously giving them um, a non-standard content. So the, the, the list of virtues that Nietzsche comes up with would not be similar to the list of virtues that other virtue theorists come up with. Um, but yeah, interesting question. Tom, is there anything you'd like to add to that or should we move to a 
different question. No, I had like two points on that. One was that I think it's similar to Aristotle and the other was that Mark Alfano works on this. So, you know, I think we've done, <laughs> definitely, definitely nailed it. So. Okay, so th this is a question that came in from an anonymous attendee, but just based on having heard both of you speak about, do you think you're operating with the same conception of power? Because the question um, suggested that um, as I glossed it, Paul, Paul's idea of power was power to do things, whereas Tom's idea was power over things. Or I, I don't know if that's a legitimate distinction or, I mean, so I suppose it's just, do you feel like you're both operating with the same conception of what Nietzsche meant by power? Um, Tom, do you want to start there? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it occurred to me during Paul's introduction that maybe there was something slightly different going on and maybe that is worth kind of trying to emphasize that that I think from my side it looks very much like you know the the paradigm case is pretty much one animal eating another animal and using that other animal to then fuel its growth I mean you know it's really kind of um that that is where that is that if you want you know and now that's that's a kind of easy example for Nietzsche, but accumulation of resources, uh, the sort of people he's reading are talking about, you know, the what we'd now say with the energy, the energy within an organism that that like that that each part of the organism is trying to accumulate as much energy as possible, and that that, in, that produces a kind of constructive tension, and that produces an organism which functions as a whole. But as it were, all the little bits are trying to overcome and overpower and destroy all the other bits. And he absolutely his language is is violent. Um, his or rather his language uses violent terms. Um, he uh, is politically drawn to stories about invasion and the overpowering of one community by an invading force. And I think there's so I mean basically that's what I think the paradigm cases are. But of course because he thinks that's going on in a body between parts of us, that can't be taken as a model for everything. And I think because he also thinks that um, certain more subtle psychological games we play can be instances of power type behavior. You, know, you can't generalize to everything being violent, but I think the baseline case is just, you know, plants trying to outgrow each other and compete for space. And I did think towards the end when Paul was talking about power that there were times where I thought that that was, you know, compared to my understanding of Nietzsche, maybe a little bit softer, um, you know, uh, uh, but I think mainly because he, because the way that Paul is doing it is grounding it in human psychology. And that gives you this kind of um, what is a power, what is a powerful or power achieving action, a challenge, you know, but, but that seems like that's a, uh, slightly kind of to me that's slightly sugarcoating what Nietzsche's after which might include that kind of behavior but it definitely fundamentally looks to me like it's the nasty thing um so yeah I think that was I think that's an insightful comment from from the anonymous attendee Paul would you like to pick up on that yeah I mean I, I think Tom's right that I have a somewhat different understanding so I, I think this is a really good question and as Tom was saying it might come from um Tom's tendency to focus on biology as a paradigm and my tendency to focus on psychology. Um, because I, I think if you look at Nietzsche on power in simple biological organisms, that's what it is, right? It's like one organism dominating a tree growing taller than another tree, a, a lion eating a gazelle, whatever. Um, but I think if you look at his analyses of the way that power operates culturally and also within individual human beings, it's a subtler account. Um, it certainly it can include those forms of brute dominance but it also, um, and I think more commonly, includes a lot of other forms. So if we look at some of Nietzsche's paradigms of, par of powerful individuals, um, Goethe is on that list. Nietzsche himself is on that list, right? Uh, Beethoven is on that list. These aren't people who are going out in the streets and uh, pounding down their opponents, right? It's not the, it's not the, the strong man who's uh, clubbing his opponents or whatever. It, they're dominant in the sense that they're producing values that become culturally dominant or ways of life that become culturally dominant, that they're bringing people under their sway in a subtler way, in a way that to make sense of that we need to look, I think, at the psychology. But yeah, so basically I think that um, the common core to all of these characterizations of power is the idea that you will power to the extent that you 
manifest what I was calling a kind of challenge seeking behavior where you aim not just at the attainment of some determinate state of affairs, but also to encounter obstacles or resistances or challenges and in the course of so doing, and that can modify the way you pursue that original end. So Nietzsche manifests power in writing non-traditional intellectually incisive philosophy books rather than just you know the standard dribble. Um, Beethoven by doing that with music and so on. Um, so, so I think we do have somewhat different understandings of power. I think it's a good question. Can I can I say something else on that or is it I don't know Anthony whether oh, you'd like to that's absolutely fine yeah by all means um you know I I I um I guess my feeling about this is just that um as an observation about what gets taken up in the kind of literature on Nietzsche you know you'll read a lot of commentators talking about in in to say in English in philosophy departments which is where we kind of are about people like Goethe and Beethoven. And it's true that Nietzsche, like, I don't know whether Nietzsche says that, I don't know whether Nietzsche ever talks, talks about Beethoven in terms of power, um, but he he has some remarks on Goethe in terms of nature, which are quite hard to understand. But, um, you know, to give you another example of the sort of thing he talks about in the genealogies, this very widely read text, um, Nietzsche's very taken with this theory that was then current, no longer current, to be clear, which was that Europe, you know, the history of Europe was the history of um, you know, an Aryan invasion, so an invasion of kind of blonde, powerful kind of warrior types who show up from Central Europe. I mean, the views about where they showed up from sort of, you know, vary, but, you know, roughly the steps. Um, and they storm into Europe and they take over and they subjugate the local populations. And, you know, that is Nietzsche's, I mean, that is Nietzsche's absolutely bang central example of what he thinks is going on when power is involved. And, you know, we as commentators, uh, you know, broadly speaking, tend to prefer to talk about what is it about Beethoven and what is it about Goethe that he thinks connects with power. But, you know, to me, it's like if if we're doing the historical thing, as I said, I'm, you know, if we're concentrating on the historical story, those passages which are rather uncomfortable reading, especially if we're trying to tell people that Nietzsche is this valuable important philosopher that everyone should read those are they just tend to it's not even that they get um it's not even that they get discussed and discounted it's that they don't get mentioned and yet we know that he thought this and we know what he was reading to to to, to encourage him so I I'm still I'm still inclined to think that power is kind of a thing that looks a lot like maybe the thing we'd rather he didn't mean and that those passages where he talks about um uh, there's that sort of Aryan invasion type theory are are representative of a deeper view about what it is to be powerful. Um, though there are others, right? So we agree that there are others. It's not the only way, but but yeah, I'm still I'm still on a kind of um, it, that that's why I've landed where I've landed. Yeah, if I can say one thing, um, I mean it's it's notable though that that's an example from prehistory, right? So it's compatible with thinking that the way that Nietzsche wants power to be manifest nowadays um, would look very different than that, right? Um, so that's an example that I mean, Nietzsche doesn't give specific dates, but we're talking about events that occurred thousands of years ago um, under a very different cultural setting with very different values at play. Um, when we look at his more recent exemplars of ruling power, I think they do tend to be these more cultural um, and intellectual examples, which is not to say that they exclude. I don't think they, by Nietzsche's lights do exclude uh, these sorts of violent tendencies. Um, but which is to say, I, I think that um, we can recognize those episodes um, as counting as manifestations of power without thinking that that's the type of behavior to which Nietzsche's ethical theory would commit individuals in modernity. Okay, so th there's two um, clusters of questions themed on the art and psychology. So I'll ask the art ones, Tom, because aesthetics is part of his um, research thing. So there's one who could be from a, a family member, Jack Stern, who asks, what importance do your respective accounts of Nietzsche's moral philosopher assign to art and beauty? And this links in with a question from Paul Tierney, who asks, where does art fit into Nietzsche's conception of human priorities? Is art a way of expressing a will? To power. So, Tom, do you want to start on that? If you if you fancy digging in, and then pass it on to Paul. Yes, I see the question from Jack. Just to make sure I'm responding. Okay, so 
um, uh, how does art and beauty uh, relate to the things I've been saying? And what, where was the other one? I'm sorry, I just want to make sure that okay. I have... For me, at least, it's the second one down, right the at the top, down, Paul right Tierney. Top. Where does art fit in? Okay, yeah. So, um, um, basically, in the later works, which is the period that I'm talking about, uh, there are two broad categories of things that Nietzsche says that fit in with the story that I've been talking about. Um, the first is that you analyze art depending on whether it, roughly speaking, furthers what he thinks is the natural set of goals that we've been describing in terms of power. And then we've had our conversation about what that looks like. But, you know, does the art promote power or not in the sense that he understands it? And uh, so, for example, um, he might say of Wagner's late work that it undermines it in various ways. Why does it undermine it? Well, thematically, it's Christian in the sense that it um, it tells a story where the self is to be renounced and undermined, and it's theory, it's 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 an artistic rendering of Schopenhauer's view, which is exactly the opposite of the Nietzschean view I've been describing, where um, you know the thing you want to do is do the exact opposite of what nature wants you to do and um, art can help you do that. So there can be artists who um, believe and agree with and try and artistically produce um, in, their, uh, in their viewers, in their consumers, the thing that Nietzsche doesn't like. So that's one kind of way in which he'll analyze art on that basis. There's another more interesting and slightly more subtle thing that he'll say about art, uh, which, shows up, which shows up in the genealogy of morality really in parentheses, but I think it's it tells you the sorts of things he's thinking, which is that one of the things that Nietzsche thinks is associated with power seeking of the kind that I'm describing is something which we can just loosely call um, error, just getting things wrong. Uh, and I can't ex expand on that as much as I would like to, as much as I would like to, um, given the time. But what I think I can say is that art plays an important role for Nietzsche because it's something where uh, we know that in some sense it's not real, it's not truthful, it's not how things really are, and yet it still speaks to us. So it's a form of activity which we value in which we accept that we get things wrong. And Nietzsche's analysis is that that places it on the same side as life or biology or whatever because he thinks that life and biology um, uh, is on the side of error in some sense. And so that's another way in which art fits into the story that I'm trying to describe. And I guess one last sense in which art is relevant is that Nietzsche will sometimes just try to tie our conception of beauty with our conception of biological strength and fulfillment and so on. So he can sometimes see things in that way as well. So those are some of the ways that art relates to what we've been talking about. Yeah, and I um, I agree with all that. I, I mean, I think another dimension to it also is, I'm sure Tom would agree, is the stuff on affirmation. So Nietzsche is very concerned with this um, plight that he thinks moderns face um, in light of what he calls the death of God, the collapse of traditional religious structures and interpretations of human life. So he worries about a form of impending nihilism that could arise. Um, when we feel destabilized or unmoored as a result of these loss of, of evaluative frameworks that traditionally provided us with meaning. And in books like The Gay Science, one thing that he's very interested in exploring is the way in which we can draw certain lessons from art in attempting to cultivate um, an affirmative attitude toward life despite the recognition of uh, the, the loss of these traditional groundings and so forth. So. Um, some of that relates to what Tom was saying about the way in which art doesn't demand um, external backing in the way that traditional conceptions of values may have. Um, art, he thinks, can serve as a model as well for the, the interconnectedness that he thinks good and bad things have with one another. So like a notable feature of um, novels, television shows, and so forth is the way that um, evil or appalling individuals can be really aesthetically appealing and engaging and interesting. They can serve as a model for the way in which um, what can be attractive about something is its badness, um, not as a dispensable feature of that thing, but as the very thing that draws your acclaim and interest. So I think that in that way too, art can figure in Nietzsche's quest to give us a way of bearing this affirmative attitude toward life that he wants to cultivate, but which he thinks is potentially threatened by uh, features of modernity, such as the death of God. So it's really, uh, so I think art and 
aesthetic phenomena generally are, are very central to his concerns. Okay, so Paul, I did mention earlier that there was a cluster of questions related to psychology and, and the specific form they take is bringing Nietzsche into some kind of comparison with a theory in, if you like, psychology proper as a, so, so I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say the three of them that have come up and you can maybe pick one and see if they work. So number one, and sorry, I've, I've sort of, um, let's see if I can say who asked this. So this was um, Tibin John asked about the extent to which will to power can be seen as maximizing the state of quote unquote flow as famously expounded by Mikhail Shikmasenthi High or however you pronounce it. The next one is to do is from Dan Stratford and it asks whether will to power can be seen as equivalent to the drive for self-fulfillment akin to the highest um, rung of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And finally, Alison McCone um, mentions the quote, he who has a why to live can bear almost any how, and says Alfred Adler built his theory on psychotherapy on the will to power, which this quote signifies. So perhaps more generally, what do you make of the comparisons between Nietzsche and modern psychological theorists and do you think any of those examples are very relevant or pertinent? Uh, yeah it's a great question I mean it's a, a huge topic I think because I think there are a lot of connections between Nietzsche and contemporary psychology and psychoanalysis. Um, some of them questions of obvious influence and some subtler overlaps between views where the influence isn't so obvious so like the flow example might be one place to go there. Uh, the, the stuff on, um, uh, on flow aims to show that people, uh, this is simplifying a bit, but th that they're happiest when their abilities are exactly matched to the challenges that they're encountering, right? So like in, in driving, it's typically the case that we're doing something that's reasonably challenging, but that we're also quite competent to affect. And there can be a complete engage engagement of our attentions and energies and so forth. Um, so that does relate in some interesting ways to this stuff about challenge seeking behavior. I guess one difference between that and the Nietzschean view is just that Nietzsche, at least as I read him, thinks that we aim um, at ever increasing challenges, right? or at least that the exemplary individuals do. So whereas the flow literature, as I understand it, is compatible with the idea that of a kind of stasis in which um, abilities and challenges are matched sort of at the same level throughout an individual's life, Nietzsche would think that if that happens, if there's not growth in one's capacities for manifesting power, that that constitutes a form of defect. Right. So Nietzsche would think that we, we, there's a uh, self-heightening or magnifying aim to, to power. Um, but nonetheless, there's some interesting overlap there. Um, the self-fulfillment stuff, um, that's a tough question. I mean, I think that uh, it needn't be linked to self-fulfillment in that. So insofar as self-fulfillment is interpreted um, as in a somewhat um, rich or sophisticated way um, where it's associated with seeing one's life as meaningful and, and so forth. Um, I think will to power needn't go alongside that, although certainly it can and it can promote that. But I think we can imagine, um, for example, well, actually, maybe these cases are more complex. And I, I don't know, whenever I start to say something about Nietzsche, I'm tempted to backtrack because of the complexity. But um, what I was going to say initially is that Nietzsche thinks that ascetic Christian priests are exemplary, in some, in some ways exemplary manifestations of will to power. They manifest a very high degree of will to power in counteracting their natural tendencies, their instincts, their desires for sexuality and comfort and so forth. Um, they're manifesting will to power in the obvious sense that they're suppressing or struggling with or contending with elements of their psychology that are very forceful, right? Um, but depending on how you interpret self-fulfillment, it might look like there we have a high expression of will to power that doesn't go along with fulfillment. Of course, the qualification is maybe they are fulfilled if you interpret fulfillment in a certain way. Um, and then the why, how quote. Um, yeah, I mean, so I think that's bound up with the stuff about power. Nietzsche does associate, um, he does think that human beings have a kind of need for meaning, as he puts it in Gay Science One, um, that they've acquired historically, that we need to view our existences as meaningful. That one way of doing that traditionally has by link, been by linking them to some sort of purpose to be achieved by the life, whether divinely given or somehow self-imposed. And that part of what that quote is bringing out is a way of preserving um, that need and fulfilling that need 
uh, by pursuing difficult goals independently of the quest for external backing of that goal that's been present into traditional metaphysical and religious systems. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot to say about all that stuff and the way that Nietzsche relates to psychoanalysis. So I'm just scratching at the surface here, lots of fertile connections there. Great, thank you. I mean, I think I'll ask Tom another little cluster of questions just to get as many asked as possible, even though I'm sure he'd probably love to add a few things to the Nietzsche and psychology thing. So, I mean, power has obviously been one of the major kind of questions that's repeatedly come up. So Charles Tabern asks about um, reconciling will to power and sort of love of fate. So he asks, how would the love of fate dovetail with the primacy or value of power? And similar-ish, Lottie Pike, asks, how would you say Nietzsche's views on free will fit in with his ideas about seeking power? So not necessarily the same question, but they're kind of bringing in questions of free will and the sort of love or acceptance of fate into dialogue with questions of power and how that may relate to his broader ethical picture. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good question from, from a perspective of sort of, um... Um, once you get stuck into Nietzsche's text. So I think these are questions coming from, from, from people who obviously have, have kind of read and thought about Nietzsche in some way. And the idea of um, amor fati or the eternal recurrence is typically, those are two different things, but same sort of ballpark area is that Nietzsche seems to speak of as an ideal, the idea that you would um, uh, uh, welcome everything that's ever happened to you. That's the love of fate and that you would um, be pleased to, well, you would welcome the news that you would live your life again and again, eternally, forever, and so on. Um, and there are various sources for both of those ideas. I mean, just, just to kind of say one fairly uh, uh, significant, maybe slightly disappointing connection between those two things and, 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 um, and the kind of affirmation of power that I've been describing. Um, if you think of the kind of power that we've been talking about as a fundamental characteristic of all living things, then, and you think of um, fate and the eternal recurrence of everything as being affirming or welcoming a situation in which those things were operative such that there was just no other option, then you can see them coming together. I mean, to put it rather, to put it sort of more bluntly, um, if life is governed by will to power and you have a you know, positive attitude towards life, then you kind of have a positive attitude towards world to power. It's hard for you not to have both of them at the same time. And if that seems, you know, that seems sort of easy or tenuous, um, this is exactly how Schopenhauer does it. And Schopenhauer is the main source for this, for Nietzsche. So Schopenhauer's line is, was, the, the person who thinks of eternal, the, the first person to talk about eternal recurrence as an idea of affirmation of life is Schopenhauer. And the thing that he says is basically, if you're the kind of person who just wants to keep living and living and living and living, then obviously you think that nature is a good thing because you'd have to, otherwise you'd want to be dead. And effectively, that's the sort of connection that I think Nietzsche is probably likely drawing between those two things. But there is a lot more, uh, there's a lot more, as with the psychology story to say about that, but that's one kind of answer to that question. Okay, so Paul, I'll put a final question to you, which um, maybe Tom could also say some final words, because unfortunately we're pretty much at the end now. So this is for Michael Babbage. Um, he asks, are activities the only valuable things about human life? Some of our interactions like cultivating friendships and playing games are essentially both active and passive and they count as the things we care most about. So I guess it's a question about the role of non-striving or non-assertion of power in a Nietzschean ethics. What place is there for passivity amidst all of this activity? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So it's a complicated question. So I guess it, it's gonna to get somewhat deeper into interpretive issues, but basically what I would say about it is that Nietzsche, so Nietzsche's will to power, that's associated with activity, right? So um, it's this act of striving for challenges. Now, as I read him, Nietzsche thinks that's the sort of the one value that we can't get rid of. That's what we're stuck with as a result of our psychology. Um, 
that doesn't mean that we won't have other values, right? There are all sorts of values that arise from contingent and modifiable sources. So I think Nietzsche is perfectly happy to allow um, many other values, some of which might involve a type of passivity. I, I guess I'm a, I'm a little hesitant to, to use that term because I'm not sure what exactly it will be picking out in these circumstances, but some of the values that um, like friendship, he's perfectly fine with that, obviously. Um, uh, he repeatedly praises the necessity of leisure, which looks like uh, something we might be tempted to characterize as passive, right? Um, he, he derives contemporary value systems for undermining the possibility of leisure. So you know, that looks like a, a phrase of something you might characterize as passivity. I think what's gonna be going on in these cases is that Nietzsche, um, to simplify a bit, would want us to get rid of or eliminate or try to mitigate any value which was generating direct conflicts with will to power, but will to power is going to be realized through the pursuit of other values, right? So what it is to manifest power is to have some sort of end, which might be informed by some other value, like the value of friendship, and to encounter it in a way that generates challenges or obstacles. So I, I, yeah, I think it's, um, it's perfectly possible for, for Nietzsche to recognize some value in um, activities that we might be inclined to label passive. It's just that those, those activities and those values will not have the same status for him as power. Power will be this ineradicable value for us where we're committed to valuing it just in virtue of our psychological or, or maybe if Tom's right, our biological nature. Um, other values won't be like that, but they might still have groundings in culture. They might just be arbitrarily adopted. They might be adopted for any number of reasons. So I, I hope that um, goes a little ways towards answering your question. Thank you, it certainly does. Um, Tom, I was thinking maybe you could just wrap things up with a few final comments. Like, do, do you have anything, either a reflection on the final question from Michael Babbage, which Paul just touched on, or any sort of final words before we end the session? Um, well, I mean, just first of all, thanks for all the questions which strike me as um, really good. I mean, I don't know, it could sometimes be bad to say these were surprisingly good questions, but I mean, in the <laughs> nicest possible way, these were really surprisingly good questions, and thank you very much. Um, and, Lots of them as well, unfortunately. And, we should have gone on for another half an hour, but, you know. Um, well, um, you know, uh, uh, th 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 but yeah, so thank you all, th th thank you all for those. Um, you know, I, I I don't have very much to, to, to add overall. I think if you I think if you were now to go, I hope, I hope, let's put it this way, I hope if you were now to go and pick up, um, you know, or, or pick up again a copy of one of Nietzsche's books, especially one of the later books, which is really what we've been talking about in general, um, I hope you would see some of these issues coming out, um, st standing out at you. Um, the quotation that Paul mentioned near the start is from, like, right at the start of his book, The Antichrist, and it's really kind of, these issues are really, I think, front and centre in all of the late works. So I just hope that... Um, in addition to hopefully being an interesting discussion, this will um, further people's enjoyment of the books because it's not, I'm not the first person to say this. It's a real pleasure to work on a philosopher that, you know, people like to read and people, you know, um, um, people from all walks of life, all sorts of situations have said to me that they really enjoy reading Nietzsche. So I hope it's contributed to that in addition to being a kind of academic discussion as well, of course. Great, thanks. Any final words, Paul? Oh, I'll just echo Tom's thanks. I uh, thought the questions were great. I've enjoyed the event. Um, it's been fun talking to everyone. And yeah, I hope this, uh, for those who are new to Nietzsche, I hope this helps you in making sense of his sometimes quite confusing texts. And for those who are familiar with Nietzsche, I hope it's been enjoyable to delve into these issues. Um, yeah, so I, um, I appreciate the chance to talk about these matters. Great, well, I really appreciate both of you um talking about them. It's been really great. We're back um, a week today with um, a conversation between Catherine Jenkins of University of Glasgow and Kate Ritchie of University of California, Irvine, Irvine I think it is. Um, they'll be talking about the ontology of gender. They're both um, social ontologists, which is a new and emerging field, and we'll be discussing yeah, some of the thorny and very contemporary debates relating to our conceptualization of woman, gender, and other related concepts. So,
That will be in a week's time. I'll put up a slide for it in a second. Um, but thank you all for tuning in. Thanks very much to Paul and Tom for a really great discussion about this, this theme, which um, isn't always the first thing you think about with Nietzsche, but actually there's a lot there. And I think I've got more of a sense of it now. So thank you both very much. And um, thanks for all the questions. Sorry as ever for those that weren't asked. And um, I think I'll sign off at this point. So bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.